Okay, this video is more information on LPA. And this guy right here, his name is Nader Ali. He is a cardiologist. He's an interventional cardiologist. Those are the guys who do the uh, balloon angioplasty and stenting and other coronary artery procedures, you know, AFib ablations and all that kind of stuff. So you got to be a pretty talented uh, guy to do that because you, you can't BS, you know, doing interventional procedures. You either know what you're doing or you don't. And it's obvious real fast. On the other hand, though, do I think he's a BS artist? Yes, I do. I mean, his, he names his YouTube channel Eat Mostly Fats. What kind of a cardiologist tells people to eat more fats, okay? <laughs> you know, and it's my also opinion, too. You don't hear me talking about the high-fat nutrition experts. I think this whole high-fat vegan thing is a bunch of crap, okay? And what do you got all these high-fat vegan and so-called experts who I think are phony? They're telling people eat more uh, flax and soy and nuts, uh, and olive oil. I think that's all a bunch of BS, by the way. I think that's all bad for blood flow. I would not do it, just so you know. Okay, so now getting back to this guy, the cardiologist who says eat more fats. Why would I even talk about him? Well, he's actually interesting. He mentions the point that LPA, lipoprotein A, it's the little, I'll, I'll show you a picture of it, like, like that baseball. Imagine you had a baseball, the red seams are the apo B uh, protein that's like a belt wrapped around the LDL cholesterol particle. And then the LPA just uh, hangs off of it. I'll show you pictures of it in just a moment. But the point is this. The LPA particle makes the blood more prone to clotting. It is very similar to plasminogen uh, protein for dissolving blood clots. But what it does is it competitively inhibits. It blocks the ability, let's say a TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, to activate plasmin to dissolve clots. Okay, And by inhibiting that it makes you more prone to form clots because you can't dissolve the little ones that already started forming. Okay, so LPA increases the tendency to clot. And what is atherosclerosis? Atherosclerosis is just a blood clot. You need to know that. Nothing will make sense in atherosclerosis to you, to you, to you acknowledge that and realize that. Okay, so now this is these are the slides from Eat Mostly Fats, the cardiologist Nader Ali, and he's you know has a nice slide here saying the LPA subunits are called Kringles because they look like a Kringle. It's the name of a pastry. You know, I was going to draw Santa Claus as there, Chris Kringle for Santa Claus. Okay, so now here's why Ali is interesting. He shows a paper saying having a low lipoprotein A is associated with increased risk of cancer. <laughs> okay, so what he's trying to do is say, instead of saying LPA is so bad, maybe it's good. Okay, and you know, is he doing something useful or is he just confusing people for the heck of it? Okay, I'm actually not completely sure of that, but I'm, I'm just raising the point. There's some interesting things. So he says if your LPA is congenitally low, you might have increased risk of cancer. He also showed um, papers that he said imply that LPA is important for wound healing, okay, that it has a benefit. Okay, um, so then he said, is LPA an arsonist or a firefighter? Okay, um, so anyways, did I have another slide of it? Let's see if I had anything else good here. Okay, I just used these two. All right, now I'm going to get into another doctor, um, a Dr. Sloop. So here's this doctor here, Dr. Gregory Sloop. Here is the paper that he wrote. By the way, this guy, Gregory Sloop, I think he's the best researcher in the entire world for atherosclerosis. I've read tons and tons of stuff on atherosclerosis, okay? Um, here's the name of his paper. Apolipoprotein A, so that's the name of the protein itself, and here's a picture of it right here. It's attached to the Apo B on the LDL particle. The baseball is the LDL particle. The red seams of the baseball are the Apo B lipoprotein, and then attached to the Apo B by a disulfide linkage is the lipoprotein A, which is also an Apo protein, Apo protein A, little a, we'll call it little a. Okay, so anyways, what he's saying is he thinks that from his research, the LPA is really just a defective copy of the plasminogen uh, gene. And because it's a de defective copy with a bunch of mutations in it, it's similar enough to inhibit the function of plasminogen, but it's different enough that it doesn't help dissolve blood clots. So it's really just in the way, something that doesn't belong there. Okay, But this explanation of historically, evolutionarily, if you will. He thinks the plasminogen gene got duplicated and then the extra copy being not needed acquired mutations and then the mutations led to it becoming uh, just a dysfunctional problem, if you will. Um, and he says the fact that it's a pseudogene, meaning a defective copy of a gene, he says that enables it to be prothrombotic, which we already know, 
that enables it to be variable in length because it doesn't matter. If a protein really mattered, you know, like some of our electron transport proteins in the mitochondria, those things are evolutionarily preserved or conceptually preserved uh, in great detail. They don't vary because if they varied even a little bit, they wouldn't work and the animal, the creature would be screwed and it would die. Okay, versus something that doesn't really matter. It can vary a tremendous amount. It can vary a tremendous amount in concentration. It can vary a tremendous amount in shape and length because it's really just an ornament, a whole lot of nothing. Uh, but it increases blood viscosity. Anything that makes the blood thicker, blood viscosity increase, tends to cause more clots, more and atherosclerosis, a clot in an artery um, is atherosclerosis. You can also get more clots in veins. We don't usually call a clot in a vein atherosclerosis. And the, and the reason for that is usually you need hypertension, hypertension to injure the arterial wall before you'll form uh, an arterial blood clot. Okay, and that's why hypertension is the main risk factor for arterial atherosclerosis. That's also why you don't get atherosclerosis in veins. I looked at a bazillion CT scans with IV contrast, and I can tell you, you don't get them in a vein unless the only time you're going to get them in something flowing towards the heart is like if you have pulmonary venous hypertension or something, okay? You have to have that hypertension there to make it happen in a so-called arterial-like system. And that's also why you can get them in a dialysis shunt because you've got arterialized blood coming in at high pressure. Okay, and then the real question is for somebody watching this, you're probably wondering, why am I going on and on? What's the point of all this? And here's the point of it all. It is said that LPA, lipoprotein A, is elevated in about 20% of persons. And the drug companies are really hyping this. I joke that they're making a tempest in a teapot because if it's 20% of the American population, think about it, that's you know tens of million, about 100 million more patients for them. All right, so they love this idea. Oh, and these patients need to be treated with statins or you know the PCS canine inhibitors and all this stuff. And what I'm trying to tell you is if it's that common, 20% of persons to have high LPAs, then we already know you can prevent significant side effects from it, thrombotic events, just by going on the Esselstyn diet. Because if it was present in 20% of the patients and he had in his you know, big study, the four-year study, 99.4% no recurrent events, and he says the only one person who had a recurrent event was one who didn't follow the diet. Well, he must have had probably about, you know, being close to 200, you could assume he probably had about 40 patients with elevated LPA. And, you know, none of them, or at most one of them, had an event. So the Esselstyn diet works. So to put it all in a, in all, in a concise summary, and essentially it's a moot point. Basically, you could prevent the su significant sequela, prothrombotic sequela, side effects of LPA just by following the Esselstyn diet. You know, and then if you haven't tested this, it's a little bit of a pain in the butt to test your LPA. Compared to the other lipid stuff, mine took about a week to come back. Uh, so, you know, other stuff, you can get it the next day. So what he's basically saying here, oh, there's going to be something else funny in the sloop paper. I'll get to it here on the next page. But what was nice was he kind of gave you a, a peaceful feeling of what it's all about. There's always more information in biology, but you just need to know what's going to determine what you do. And the intelligent thing to get out of all this is continue to follow the Esselstyn diet. Okay, um, so here's some stuff I think was funny. I actually contacted the author, Sloop, because I wanted to talk to him about atherosclerosis. Now, here's one of the things he says. The best treatment for lipoprotein A elevation is apheresis to remove the blood lipids, okay? And he says if that is not available... One can also donate blood, a therapeutic phlebotomy. And so I was laughing at him because anybody who's ever started a lot of IVs, I've started thousands of IVs, you know, in patients' arms, you will notice that there's like three groups of patients that are pain in the butt, okay? If the patient's an IV drug addict, they trashed all their veins. You know, I used to have to start IVs in the foreheads of these drug addicts and all kinds of weird spots because it was hard to find a vein on them. Okay, the other persons who have bad veins are, you know, cancer chemotherapy patients, okay? They've had a bazillion blood draws and... Who knows what's been injected in their arms? Usually you can put it in through a central line, but they also have poor veins. And then, of course, dialysis patients because they got all these shunts uh, in their arms for dialysis and whatnot, or they don't even let you uh, do anything in their arm. But anyways, the reason I went through all that was Sloop says that he likes to donate blood as a way to prevent atherosclerosis. 
And I was teasing him. I said, "Yeah, you're a genius. Okay, what you're gonna do is you're gonna tr if you if you go for blood donation like every six months or something, and you've been doing that for years, you're gonna trash all your veins by your elbow, your anti-cubital fossa, and everybody's gonna think you're a drug addict." So I thought that was very funny. Like one of the best scientists in the world, <laughs> and he looks like a drug addict because he donates blood. So I told him, why don't you become a vegan? He's like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to do that yet. And I go, how could you be so smart about atherosclerosis and not, you know, study and know the low-fat vegan diet? So I find that funny. And that's pretty typical, by the way, in, in medical research. You'll have some guy who's a genius, and this guy's a genius. <laughs> but they don't know anything about nutrition. Okay. Um, let's see what else is funny. And also, why, why would blood donation help so much? Well, number one, you lower your uh, hematocrit for a while, the percentage of blood that is occupied by red blood cells, and that makes the blood less thick. Lowers blood viscosity, which will lower the tendency of the blood to clot. That's why premenopausal women virtually never have a myocardial infarction because they're menstruating, and that lowers their hematocrit, their red blood cell count. And that's the main determinant of how thick the blood is because you know, the vast majority of, red, of cells in the blood are red blood cells, more than 99%. So if you lower that, you're lowering things a lot. The second thing is when... Red blood cells first come out of the bone marrow. The young red blood cells, they're more flexible. They're more deformable. It's thought that over time, you know, they progress towards their life typically of 120 days and they get stiff over time due to two things, couple, at least two things. They're known to get a little glycated over time, like your hemoglobin A1C getting glycated. In addition, you get something whereby a phospholipid from the inner uh, face of the uh, plasma membrane of the red blood cells called phosphatidylserine. It moves from the inner leaflet to the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. That's called phosphatidylserine externalization. And that over time also stiffens the red blood cell. The point being is once the red blood cells are stiff, they tend to be removed by the spleen. Typical red blood cells about seven microns. Typical capillaries about five microns. So it's in a typical, you know, like uh, capillary in the spleen for red blood cell removal is about three microns. So it's got to be really flexible to go through that. That's like doing the limbo, if you will. So these old stiff RBCs get removed by the spleen. The spleen's like the red blood cell graveyard when they're more stiff. So anyways, that's why uh, having more fresh, young red blood cells coming out of the bone marrow like a woman does who's menstruating is protective against a, th against a thrombotic event. This is also why LPA, lipoprotein A, is prothrombotic because it's bulkier and it's different, it, it makes the red blood cells more bulky, more prone to causing thrombus. In addition, it also has an inhibitory effect blocking blood cell, blood clot lysis through uh, plasminogen, you know, plasmin, TPA, tissue plasminogen, Managing activator and all that. So, anyways, what was the benefit of all this? I told you that all you got to do uh, that Esselstyn diet should work, like we talked about, because there's so many patients. And I also explained the pseudogene concept helps explain some of the mysteries of LPA, why it is so variable in number, why it is so variable in size, why is it um, so different uh, in humans compared to other animals. So, anyways, I hope that was interesting and made sense.